Hi, this is the Chapter 7 overview video. In Chapter 7, Electric Potential, we cover the last of central concepts in static electricity, electric potential. Let me go through each of sections highlighting the things that you should pay attention to and make sure you understand as you go through. Let me start out with the section 7.1, Electric Potential Energy. Depending on how gravity was covered in your Physics 4A, this material in section 7.1 could be a review for you. And in either case, we are going to be relying on heavily on the analogy between electric force and gravitational force to help build up your intuition for electric potential energy. Now, if your Physics 4A class didn't spend a lot of time working out the gravitational potential energy using the inverse square form of gravitational force, well, this is an excellent opportunity to see the mathematics involved in it because the electric force is also an inverse square law force, just like the gravitational force. So this bit of material should be reviewed from Physics 4A that work done by a force, a variable force, is given by integral of force times the infinitesimal displacement. And the idea of potential energy comes from the fact that when a conservative force does work, in particular negative work, apparently taking out energy, that energy taken out doesn't just disappear. In some sense, it gets stored. So that's the intuitive origin for this expression. The change in potential energy is minus of the work done by conservative force. So you can look at the calculation here for potential energy between two point charges interacting. And one thing I want to point out is this convention of setting the reference potential energy to be zero at infinitely far away is a very common reference. It's because it's a, what you might call universal reference. A particular location may be very unique to a local situation, like height of a table, for example. But the distance of something being infinitely far away, that's a reference that almost anybody could use. So we use that reference to say that's where we have zero potential energy and everything else is measured relative to that. It works very well with finite charge distributions. All right, so this is a mix of review and new material. The completely new material starts with the next section, 7.2, electric potential and potential difference. So I prefer to use the word voltage in place of electric potential. In any case, they are synonymous. They mean the same thing. But the reason I prefer the word voltage is because it's uh, less confusing uh, compared to electric potential energy. So electric potential is defined in terms of the electric potential energy. That's one of the reasons it's confusing. And we define it as the voltage is electric potential energy divided by the test charge. I hope this looks familiar because this is sort of how we define electric field in reference to electric force and how we are defining electric potential or voltage is taking the same route. So as you will see as you read it down, you are going to see similar relationships. To get the electric potential energy, you take the electric potential and multiply by charge the same way you did for electric force and field. And you can relate electric potential directly to electric field so that you don't ever have to involve the test charge in description of the electric potential or voltage. This is what I prefer to take as the definition of electric potential. That it's the line integral of electric field that did with the path element from a point to the ending point. That gives the change in the voltage. 
Or if you, your starting point is the reference point, for example, that infinitely far away point for point charges, then you could call this potential at point P. Now, I hope this reminds you of how we defined potential energy. And it's all meant to be analogous. And just like with the potential energy, the exact path you take actually doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the beginning and the end point. This all ties to what you learned in Physics 4a, that the total work done by a conservative force is path independent. All right, uh, there are some examples of electric potential calculation. Please pay close attention here. This is the main way we are going to be covering electric potential in this class. So we have some charge distributions where we can calculate the electric field easily using Gauss's law. And using that electric field, we are going to calculate potential. Now, there are other ways in which electric potential is mathematically useful. That's in the next section. And even though we are not going to cover electric potential this way, for the most part, this is something useful for you to be aware of. This is material that's more relevant in the upper division, where you might have to do more complicated calculations that um, cannot be simplified using Gauss's law. So what the examples in this section are showing are the super principle. If you have a system of multiple point charges, the voltage at some point P is simply the sum of the voltage due to each of the charges in the system. Now, here's one really nice thing about potential, is that like with energy, it's a scalar quantity. So when you're adding all these contributions, you don't have to worry about direction. And in fact, that will be highlighted throughout the examples that you will see in this section. But as I just mentioned, maybe with the exception of the dipole and possibly the ring, which is here, possibly the ring, we are not going to do a lot of calculations this way. It's uh, mainly because of the limited utility of this approach for our lower division class. But just so that you know what to anticipate when you go to upper division, let me show you in the next section how this uh, can be the first step of calculating electric field, but in a way that's easier than the method you have seen earlier. So in the next section, you see the inverse of the relationship between potential and electric field that you saw before. So it's appropriately called determining field from potential. So the relationship you have seen before is this. The change in electric potential is the line integral of electric field, or minus of the line integral. So the inverse is this, that electric field is minus of the derivative of the electric potential with respect to a spatial coordinate. More formally, using calculus, this is stated this way. So if you have a line segment S, you might write it this way. But we are used to dealing with the coordinate. So for example, in Cartesian coordinates, we can determine components of electric field from our knowledge of the electric potential. You take the partial derivative with respect to each component thing. So if you want the x component, you take the partial derivative of potential with respect to x. If you haven't seen partial derivative before, it's actually a simpler derivative than the total derivative. It's just saying that as you take the derivative with respect to x, you treat everything else as constant. You treat y and z as constant. So for those of you who have taken multivariable calculus, you might have seen this notation here for gradient. So combining this into one simple looking vector notation, you can say that the electric field vector is minus of the gradient of electric potential. 
And this is where if you want to do explicit calculation, it gets rather um, upper division-y. <laughs> so we won't do any of this, so don't worry about this. But as an example, you can see how this way of calculating can actually be easier than what you have done before. I think I have that example of ring of charge. So this electric field due to a ring of charge was done earlier in chapter 5, doing the integral over the thing, direct calculation of electric field. Now, as you look at this example 7.18, this is what you will see. The difficult part of calculating the potential, which was done in the previous section, it was done much more easily because you didn't have to worry about the directions. You were just basically adding up all the constant things going around the ring. The only thing that you really had to be careful is you had to be careful to keep Z as a variable for use here. So now here, to find the electric field, all you need to do is take the derivative. So whereas with calculation of an electric field by integration, there were a lot of little things that you had to remember. You had to remember that the electric field is a vector, pairwise cancellation, all that stuff. This alternate way of calculating makes it simpler. It makes it so that there are fewer things you can forget. So this is the one example that might be worthwhile for you to know how to do. Otherwise, I would say um, this gradient stuff, you are going to see it when you do multivariable calculus. And when you see material like this in upper division, you won't have to worry about this for this class. All right, so we have two more sections left. The next two sections are sort of um, graphical tools and application of what we covered in, in this chapter so far. So equipotential surface or equipotential lines, it finishes the graphical tool that we introduced earlier. We introduced the field lines and equipotential lines are what goes paired with the field lines. There are some relationships between them that you can draw. Um, the biggest one is that the equipotential line is always perpendicular to the field line. If you read it through the section, they will explain why. And as we are talking about equipotential surfaces, this is also a nice place to wrap up the discussion of conductors. This is because the conductor surfaces naturally define equipotential surface. As we have talked about before, the electric field inside the conductor is zero, which means any path you take within the conductor, when you calculate the voltage difference, going to be zero. So when you say a point on a conductor is at some voltage, that means the entire conductor is at the same voltage. So in a nice symmetrical case like sphere, well, it's kind of um, easy to see. But even in a case where it's not a nice simple arrangement, for example, two different spheres connected by a wire, we can say that they are at the same voltage because there's a path I can draw from here to here in electrostatic equilibrium where electric field is zero all the way along the path. And using that, you can drive some interesting result. You can see it here. And that result is used to argue how when you have an irregularly shaped conductor, the charges accumulate near the point end. There's a demonstration I can show you using that um, I will record a video when I can. And the final section is the applications of electrostatics. I will say, so these are interesting examples. The only one that you will really see and deal with and have a demo of in the lab is the Van der Graaff generator. So please do take some time to read about it, know what's involved here. And the other examples, they are useful examples of modern technology to know about, but uh, I won't really test you on that. There are other things I want to test instead. So with that, that's uh, everything in chapter 7. As you can see, it's a fairly long chapter and all the sections are covered. And you will see how these concepts are applied to electrostatic problem solving better as you are working through the problem sets, like with the last week. 
So until the chapter 8 overview video, bye.